how do people go through life without God? How do they go through hardships without God? How do you suffer trial without God? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever asked that question out loud? I know I have. And today we're going to talk about that and a lot more. I'll see you back here in 20 seconds. Welcome back. I'm Jennifer Richmond, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, where we love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are women who enthusiastically and intentionally dwell in the Word and let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. You can find Bible studies and video teaching like this on my blog and the Dwelling Richly podcast. Subscribe to this channel, hit that little church bell so you can get notified whenever I drop a new video. Let's get into the Word. All right, welcome. We are going to get started. Let's go ahead and get into God's Word. I'm Jennifer Richmond, and you're in the well Dwelling Richly Bible Study. You're in the right place, is what I was going to say. So, right place and Dwelling Richly right dwelling. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we're going to have a great time. As you can see, today's a little bit different. Normally, we do like one lesson every day, but we're going to take two days-ish or so to cover this passage, Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. And so you can stick around. I'm going to do this in part one and part two. It's all going to be streamed together in one video, um, but you can break it up and, and watch it at your convenience, however works best for your schedule. There's a lot to cover, and I wanted to make sure that we have time in the study to go through all the details and just really love being in God's Word together. All right, so let's do like we always to begin our time together with prayer. I want to know that as you check in, say hi, leave a comment, hit that like button. Uh, it helps me know that you're there. And not only that, it's like a little private little roll call in a sense. As I see you leave a comment, I know how to pray for you by name. And you can always, always even leave a prayer request. If you'd like to have me pray for you in a more of a private way, please feel free to reach out through email, jennifer at jenniferrichmond.com. I will put the information <laughs> right over there. Always get turned around like, what am I pointing at? I'll put the information right over there. <laughs> All right. Uh, feel free to reach out. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to connect with you. Right now, let's go ahead and pray together. Pray for me as I teach through this time with you. Pray for you that as you're listening, but pray for our community together that we're all really, truly dwelling richly in God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power that it brings into our life, how it recenters us on what's most important and help us today as we get into your word together to truly let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We thank you. We praise you. And we're here for you in Jesus name. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Let me go ahead and get our lesson up here on the screen for you, our scripture verse, I should say, so you can see that as we move on. Um, as I mentioned, we're in lesson 10. This is days eight and nine, which means we're going to take three pages worth, one fr a front and a back and a front of another page uh, for this lesson. We normally cover our material in about a front and a back of a lesson. So this is a little bit more, but we're going to allow for two days to do that. And so um, we begin as always with our memorize and meditate and reading the word aloud. So I'm going to go ahead and get that up here on the screen so that you can see that and say it aloud with me. Romans 11, 33 from the new international, I mean the new English translation. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how unfathomable his ways. And our passage today is, you know, in part that verse. We've been looking forward to that as we've gone through this study together. So let me go ahead and read that aloud for you. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has first given to God that God needs to repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And if you've been with us since the beginning of this section in Romans, which started in chapter 9, you know, Paul's been culminating and building and teaching us through to this point. So you can feel his energy and enthusiasm. And I'm looking forward to getting into this, uh, this section here with you. All right. Um, you can see up here at the top, if you open this lesson on uh, on your computer or on a tablet even, even on your phone, uh, you, you should be able to tap that and it will open up to all of the other references that we'll be using today in this lesson. So I'm not sure if you knew that, but 
that's how it all works. All right. So we'll go ahead and move together through this lesson so that you can uh, see it easier. I will put it up here on this screen. And of course, we're taking, like I mentioned a minute ago, taking two days to cover the passage together. So let's go ahead and get into the word. Number one. Oh, and also while I'm reading, <laughs> while I'm reading, you guys write the word. And so you can go back and listen to that again and, and let, you know, I'll speak it as you're writing it out or take the time, but do your write the word uh, section, which is how we write all of Romans or any book that we're studying in the Bible. And uh, you just hand write it out in a journal or I've provided pages for a journal. If you want to get those off my website, they're free. You can download them and use them in um, whatever capacity you want. All right. So here we go. Number one, just a big empty blank space of thought, right? That's me. <laughs> you know, if you've been in this Bible study, you'll see me put a quote and then the person who it's attributed to or the person I'm imagining saying it. And so in this case, it's just a big empty space. I got nothing to say. And that's coming from me. So think of a time in your life when you experienced something so amazing, you had no words to describe it. Share about that moment and attach a photo here. If you can, I would love to hear from you right now. Put that in the comments. And I don't know if you're like me, then there's been different moments of your life where you've had that kind of I don't even know what to say right now. And it could have been a moment of great joy. It could have been in a moment of uh, deep sorrow, whatever that moment was, I can think of several. And uh, one that came to my mind to begin with at first was just the idea or the moment that I had when I first saw the Grand Canyon. And I know a lot of you have expressed the same thing before. You've seen the Grand Canyon and just gone, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to say. And uh, if you've ever had any buildup about it, if anyone's ever said, oh wow, the Grand Canyon is so amazing. Uh, you you kind of don't want it to be a letdown. And it wasn't at all for me. I was able to experience it for the first time with my husband and my son when he was about, I think, eight years old or so. And uh, we drove in, we got to the edge and the weather was cooperating. So we were able to have a good view and we walked up closer and closer and closer. And I thought, oh, this is, you know, this is really amazing. It's really pretty out here, but nothing could ever describe what you feel when you first look out over the edge and you just see the vastness, the rich colors, how deep, how wide, how just, it's indescribable. <laughs> I think you barely can capture it with a uh, photograph, let alone with, uh, with words. So the Grand Canyon is one of those for me. And then also probably deep loss, losing, uh, losing my, my mom and who passed away um, after a very brief illness. And uh, it, it just punched me in the gut. I, I had no words. I had just such a guttural reaction to hearing that she had passed and uh, then not being able to be there with her on that day and just how emotional that was for me. So those are the types of moments that take our breath away. It could be a height of glory, a height of our depth of pain, but they take our moments when I, I'd be curious to hear from you what that's like for you in your life and how you experience that. And if you have a photo, even better, share that. And maybe even take a picture and share that online on Instagram or on our Facebook group. I'd love to see those. As always, if you do share something, um, use our hashtag, hashtag dwelling richly, so we can see those together. All right, let's go ahead and uh, continue on in our study with the next lesson coming up here. So think back, how is Romans 11.32, this is verse from yesterday, a summary of all Paul has been teaching to this point? Skim back through your notes from each chapter and include references below for the disobedience of man and the mercy of God. I know that's a lot. We were already in chapter 11 and that's a lot behind us, but maybe you've got it enough. I've asked similar questions throughout this study um, that I'm hoping that by now you're starting to see that, that connection. So to begin with, uh, the disobedience of man and what that looks like, and then um, God, and what we see in the mercy of God and how we're impacted um, by that. So the disobedience of man, Paul, of course, opens up all of Romans. So Romans chapter one, and, and then he just moves over into talking about, you know, mankind in general and, and the Gentiles in particular, pagans in particular. And then in Romans chapter two, he kind of moves in on the Jews. 
and their sin and how they have all also fallen short. And he summarizes that in Romans 3, that all have sinned, all have fallen short. So verse 32 also summarizes all of Romans chapter 9 through uh, 11, which focuses on the problem of why the Jews were rejecting Christ. Paul shows that because of our sin, uh, salvation is only possible through Jesus Christ. And so that aspect of who we are should directly point us to, well, we've got a huge problem and that problem um, needs to have a resolution. All right. So in the next por portion of the question, the idea of the mercy of God and what has been revealed. Well, let's take a look again back at verse 32. For God has consigned, and I'm reading out of the um, uh, ESV here, for God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So do you see the split there? The disobedience of all mankind and the mercy from God available to all mankind as a result. Okay. So Romans 11.32 is a summary of all of Romans, everything that we've talked about to this point. And uh, it's just right there in this one verse. Now, there's some tough words to discuss in what that actually means. And I mentioned that in our lesson yesterday, this idea of God consigning all to disobedience. But when you go back through and you reread or you review Romans chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and we talk about the idea that not only is mankind under disobedience, but the entire creation is groaning right under that. And that God's allowing that to happen, that that in and of itself is what ends up magnifying his great love and his great mercy. But it also is the necessary ability for God to give us all free will. And so as a result, we have free will, we can choose to reject God and we have been. And that is what God is consigning us to that disobedience. That is the world. Otherwise, he would just, you know, wipe it all out and reset the world and make it so we couldn't have a choice. And we would just be consigned to be in obedience and forced to obey in a sense. Okay. So that's in part what that verse is talking about. And we're going to get together and talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming message. All right, let's go ahead and take a look over here at number three. That changes everything. So based on your reading through Romans to this point, what do you know to be true about who you are in a biblical sense? Well, hopefully by now you're also getting this part of the message uh, that if there's one thing that's true about each of us, if there's one thing that's true, it's that we need God. We have a big problem, sin. <laughs> and so hopefully by now in Romans, you're getting that point that there is no way of escaping that. And we also, you know, there's a lot of other truths about us, but that is a, a significant reality about who we are, that we need a savior. We need redemption. We need because we fail. We, we have come short of the glory of God. So moving on in the next part of, of the questions here, lesson 10, day eight and nine, um, what three aspects of God is Paul marveling at in this passage here in Romans? And let's go ahead and I'll put the scripture back up on the screen so you can see it. There we go. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how oh, unsearchable his judgments, how Unsearchable his judgments. How unfathomable his ways. There's that big word, right? So um, Paul focuses in on God's riches, God's wisdom, and God's knowledge in these three in these three, you know, highlights of who God is. So number five, consider what the riches of God means in your life. What does that look like that we have access to the riches of God? And what does that look like in your life in particular and to yourself on a, on a personal level, All right? So thinking through that, let's use some of these scriptures here to kind of help us to, to think about that from Isaiah, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians. I'll get that verse up here for us. In Isaiah... 40, uh, 45, 3, I will give you hidden treasure 
riches stashed away in secret places so that you may recognize that I am the Lord, the one who calls you by name, the God of Israel. So thinking through that, and let me scroll that up so you can see a little bit better. What is the point of God's riches? So that we can know God, that we would recognize him as Lord. All right, let's take a look at uh, Ephesians here and consider what the message here in Ephesians is. And I'll switch the screen so you can see that as well. In him, we have a redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our offenses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us all in wisdom and in insight. Okay, so how is God's grace in our life? Or how I probably should have added the word, how is God's grace demonstrated and shown to us in his life? It's lavish. It's it's not metered out. God is abundant in his grace for each of us. Let's take a look at Colossians. God wanted to make known to them the glorious riches of his mystery along, among the Gentiles, which is in uh, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So how do we experience God's riches? We experience them in us because of Christ. Yeah, it's Christ in us that we get all that. So Philippians 4, 19. And my God will supply every need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So what does God's riches look like for you on a day-to-day -day level? He is using his riches and the depths of everything that that means to provide for your needs quite simply right to make provision for you number six what does it mean to you that not only is god rich but that his riches are available to you consider the alternative that god could have had all these riches and not made them available to you and you that's just kind of one of those um techniques that I like to encourage you to use when you're doing Bible study is to see what we have and then to start thinking about, well, it didn't have to be that way. It could have been another way. And, and yet this is what we, what we do have. So think about what that means to you that God did chose, God did choose to give us his riches and what that, what does that mean for you then on a, on a daily level? I'd love to hear from you in the comments. This is a great opportunity for you to drop a comment and let me know what you guys think about that. But what does it mean to you that God's given you so much and you, it, it is that way. It is how God planned it all out. You know, for me, I, I think about uh, friends of mine who've been missionaries in other parts of the world and are engaging with people in other religions who have, um, gods, lowercase g, and they don't have a relationship with their God that is him lavishing on them him enveloping them with his love, his supplying for their daily needs. Not like we do. We have a God who loves to do that and doesn't look down on us. And kind of like I use that example from uh, Groundhog Day of Ned Ryerson, when uh, Phil steps off the curb and Ned Ryerson's behind him, watch out, that next step's a doozy. In, in that idea, you know, these gods look for us failing and then mock us basically when we fail. And then we have our God who sees our failing and provides a way for us not to fail and doesn't mock us, but provides for our salvation, right? And this is the experience of a couple different friends of mine I've had have been on the mission field and have said that the people that they engage with who are in idolatry and uh, are unaware of our loving God, the God that they engage with is capricious, is, is unkind, is finding ways to trick, trick them and uh, it, it becomes an issue of trust. And so when they learn about who the true living God is, it's such a relief because to know that God is like that. God is God of riches and he wants to lavish his riches on all of us. I think that's encouraging. I hope it's encouraging to you. All right, tomatoes and fruit salad. It has been said that knowledge is knowing a, a tomato is a fruit and wisdom is not putting tomatoes in your fruit salad. How is God's wisdom different than God's knowledge? All right, so think about that right now, how God's wisdom is different than God's knowledge. And again, I'd love to hear from you and share uh, what, what you think of the difference. 
Uh, there's a lot of ways for you to look it up in the Bible. I'm not going to provide that for you. I'd really love you to weigh in and, and hear what you have to say about it. But, the, you know, the long and short of it, hopefully you're understanding that there is a difference and using this little fruit bowl is a way to kind of remember that. Um, but yeah, so knowledge is facts that we have about something and wisdom is how that's applied and how it's applied so that there's um, there's a win, basically, that we come out ahead that, that improves our, our life, our relationships, and our connections with people. I'd love to hear from you. How do you see the difference between um, God's wisdom and God's knowledge in your life? All right, let's go ahead and take a look at number eight. Well, that's just dumb. <laughs> Every teenage ever, right? If there's one immutable truth about teens, it's their overinflated sense of their perception of the world and their inability to grasp that their parents might know a thing or two. Of course, there's always the exception, but in general, that's the rule. Teens think they know everything and are annoyed that any adult who might suggest otherwise. Paul revels in the depths of the wisdom of God in part because he knows, I need to add a he there, he knows where he's been. How does Paul's personal testimony give him a deep appreciation for God's wisdom? So if we're acting like teenagers, we don't have an appreciation because we think we know everything ourselves. We're not, we don't need God. We don't need any of that. We got it all figured out on our own. And Paul on his own has said, look, I, I didn't have it all figured out. Let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at that scripture. See if I have that called up here. And I'll read that for you out of Romans chapter 10, verse 2. Paul writes, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And wasn't that exactly Paul's situation as well? He was zealous for God, but not according to truth, not in line with the truth, as it says in the in the NEG. And so Paul knows from personal experience what it looks like to have um, zeal, passion, desire, but to not have it in line with the truth, kind of like in the same way a teenager would. Um, they, have a lot. they have their own personal zeal and passion of what they're interested in, but it's not in line with the truth of reality and the world. And until they can get that reorganized and recentered in their brain of what's reality, they're going to be constantly off. And so we want to avoid, you know, that mindset as well that we want to have our relationship with god based on the truth of who god is so what about your story does what you've been through give you a great appreciation for the wisdom of god how so or how not right so think through the times in your life that you've struggled that you've had great success um whatever it is whatever aspect of your life and how you have grown in your appreciation for the fact that god loves you and is wise, right? Like I said in the opening, how do people do it without God? How do you deal with tremendous success without it going to your head and making your life all about that? God keeps us grounded and oriented toward him. And how do you deal with tremendous tragedy and failure without becoming completely depressed? Because aside from people just coming along, you know, next to you and saying, it's all going to be great. It's all going to work out. It's ultimately empty in the end because without God, there where is the meaning really, you know, in, in the world? So uh, I hope that help, is helpful for you. I'd love to hear from you about how knowing God and having wisdom, God's wisdom has made that kind of a difference in your life. Um, let's consider what the word wisdom means. Let me put that up here um, on the screen. Uh, Sophia, the word for wisdom. Um is the root of our English word sophistication. And it's the art of using wisdom or philosophy, the love, philo is love and the sof ending there is wisdom, the love of wisdom and sophomore, teenagers, right? Wise fools, they got a little bit of knowledge. They're generally a great deal of foolishness going on in their brain about that, right? All right, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. I will get that called up so you can see it on the screen as well. All right, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, that's us, 
It's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will thwart the cleverness of the intelligent. Where is the wise man? Where is the expert in the Mosaic law? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made the wisdom of the world foolish? For since in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased to save those who believe by the foolishness of preaching. <laughs> by the foolishness of preaching. It's God, Paul's being a little sarcastic here. For jewel, uh, jewels, for Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks ask for wisdom. But we preach about Christ, uh, about a crucified Christ, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's so awesome. Make that connection back here to Romans. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human wisdom strength what <laughs> all right so let me get that called up here again for you so you can see it a little bit uh a little bit larger than life how has god revealed his wisdom how has the world in general received it well hopefully you're seeing the point here the god's wisdom is revealed in christ how has the world received that wisdom in general they have rejected it right you haven't, you're here, you're in God's word, you're doing a study, you get it. And hopefully like seeing the Grand Canyon, you think about it and see it and just are in awe and so grateful for what we have in Christ. All right. So this would be a great pausing point. We have enjoyed this first half of day eight and nine, the combo lesson that we're doing here today. And uh, again, this would be a great point if you want to take a break and, um, you know, pick this up at another time. Or stick around and I'll continue in just a moment. All right. Well, whether you've just kept on watching or you paused and came back another time, I'm glad you guys are back. Let's go ahead on to part two. And then after this, we're going to go right into the wrap up, which will be our create and share, which I normally do um, when I combine day nine and 10 together. But today's like day eight and nine and 10 bonus session for y'all today. All right, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at um, the next question here. Number 10. So God's knowledge is his omniscience, omni and science is or omni and science is all knowledge thinking back to the people and events paul referenced in um, chapters 9 through 11 what specifically might have prompted paul's cry of oh the depth like what does he have on his mind well think about what has he been saying all along about paul's omniscience um and what has been even uh, us i've you know like thinking that through and how amazing and kind of challenging and complicated that has been. Well, he specifically has talked about how he had chose Jacob over Esau, how he hardened Pharaoh's heart, how he worked through Moses and Sarah and Rebecca and Hosea and Isaiah and Christ himself to forward his plan. That's God's omniscience, right? And that's what kind of can leave us a little bit baffled sometimes when we start to think like, well, does that mean that God pre-planned that I would do this or that because he forced Pharaoh's heart to be hardened or did God really hate Esau and love Jacob in that sense and we started to learn about that and we realized no that's not what that's talking about this is just the, the sense of God's complete understanding and knowledge of everything because God's a maximally great being the definition of God and so at every point God's going to know but it doesn't mean he pre-planned um, for me to do exactly you know, pick up this tissue or move my hand here any more than he planned for people to on purpose reject him. And uh, so we've been in awe of that and we've been confounded by that. Um, but we still know that that is what makes God God. It's un it's unfathomable, right? Just like Paul's been saying as well. All right. So what exactly does God know? What exactly does God know? Well, let's take a look at Genesis and Psalm and Luke. For some familiar verses, probably things you're like, yeah, I knew that. I knew, I know that's what God knows. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at those. I've got them called up here on this screen here in Genesis 18. This is such a great story. All right. In um, Genesis 18, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child when I'm old. 
Is anything impossible for the Lord? I will return to you when the season comes round again and Sarah will have a son. Then Sarah lied, saying, I did not laugh (laughs) because she was afraid of the Lord. And the Lord said, no, you did laugh. So what do we know about the great knowledge and the omniscience of God? He knows our thoughts. He knows our quiet moments, right? Let's take a look at Psalm 139, another beautiful psalm that you're probably familiar with. O Lord, you examine me and know me. You know when I sit down and get up, even far away, um, even from far away, you understand my motives. You carefully observe me when I travel or when I lie down to rest. You're aware of everything I do. Certainly my tongue does not frame a word without you, O Lord, being thoroughly aware of it. Again, reminder, this is not God causing you to say a word this is god's awareness of your words even as you are saying and even as you before you're saying them and psalm 139 16 your eyes saw me when i was inside the womb god's got x-ray vision god's version right all the days ordained for me were recorded in your scroll before one of them came into existence that's amazing and let's take a look at another familiar verse from luke In fact, even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. You are more valuable than the sparrows. What does God know? Well, to put it bluntly and simply, he knows everything. That's what God knows. All right. Uh, Let's go ahead and take a look at the next question here. Uh, Read and highlight in your Bible, Isaiah 40 and Job 41. Um, Connect mind, counselor, and repay from Romans 11, 34 to 35, back to Romans 33. How does Paul use these rhetorical questions to connect to the point that he's making about the greatness of God? All right. So I want you to think that through. See see the word choice that Paul's using here and how does he connect that back? If you're taking a look and I've got my, um, my ESV Bible here and ready to go. He says, who has known the mind of the Lord? who has been his counselor, who has given him a gift that he might be repaid. If you think about those three concepts of of who God is, then think back up to verse 33, where he says, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. What does wisdom connect to? Well, who has been his counselor? That takes wisdom to, to be able to counsel. What about knowledge? All right. What does that connect back to? Well, that goes back to the mind. Who has known the mind of God, the knowledge of God? And are you seeing the pattern here? Riches. What does that connect us to? Who has given him a gift, right? Uh, That he might be repaid. And of course, all rhetorical questions here and all simply with the answer of no one. No one has fully known the mind of God in any of that. And so hopefully you're seeing that fabulous connection that Paul does in moving those three concepts around from us. Okay, so um, let's take a look and uh, we read uh, Isaiah 40 and Job 41 to make that connection then as well. Isaiah 40, who comprehends the mind of the Lord or gives him instruction as his counselor? From whom does he receive directions? Who teaches him the correct way to do things or imparts knowledge to him or instructs him in skillful design? And Job 41, 11, who has confronted, uh, who has confronted me that I should repay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. And the psalmist says, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs unto the Lord, right? So it all belongs to God. So Paul's making this beautiful um, reminder and connection here for us. All right. So from through and two as we take a look at this next passage is final uh, rounding the corner here on this lesson from through and two uh, how does romans eleven thirty six explain that god is the source the means and the goal of all things in every aspect of our life how do how do we see that god is the source and the means and the goal of all things in every aspect of our life. Well, Paul says here, and I'll read again from my uh, English Standard Version, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and and ever. So as we're thinking through that passage, I want us to really think 
in that big sense of what Paul is saying in all of this. So everything is from him means he gives us everything that we need. He's created it all. God is the one who created and provided all that we need. So everything is actually through him. He created it all and it comes through him. He's the means by which we get it. And God's the point of all that we need. He's He's not only the point in the sense he's the point, the reason for existence and why we exist, but he's also the end point and in terms of pointing to him. All right. So he's the, that point in, in both those senses that to God and then ultimately coming unto him, like being there with God. We're all going to him. All right. So number 14. Uh, then what is our only natural response? What what are we left to say? But what? In light of the greatness of God, the totality of his being, the completeness of his love and mercy, how should you live? Consider Isaiah's response in chapter six, verses one through five. So this is one of my absolute favorite passages in scripture. And it's Isaiah and this vision that he gets. And when I stop and think of the fact that Isaiah was God's chosen prophet, I mean, what an amazingly elevated position that God would select him and he communes with God. He gives messages on God's behalf and listen to him as especially blessed and chosen as Isaiah was. Listen to him and what he has to say in this passage. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord seated on a high elevated throne. The helm, the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs stood over him. Each one had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and they used the remaining two to fly. They called out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. His majestic splendor fills the entire earth. The sound of their voices shook the door frames, and the temple was filled with smoke. And I said, listen to Isaiah's response, Woe to me, I am destroyed. For my lips are contaminated by sin, and I live among people whose lips are contaminated by sin. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Wow. So I picked this passage from Isaiah as the point to, to consider uh, our response to this question. What's our only response? Our only response is just, woe is me. There should be no shaking our fist at heaven. There should be no, why God? You know, this is how I think it should have happened. There should be no cavalier dismissal then of God either. Our response when we truly understand, we know and we get it about who God is, is absolute desolation in the sense of who we are, like completely splayed out before God. Woe is me right? Just an absolute outpouring of how glorious and beautiful and amazing God is. All right. So in, as we wrap up this final question here, and I'll wait, switch the screen so you can see it. <laughs> how does this make you feel? How does knowing that God is great and you are not bring you comfort, frustration, confusion, any of the above? I think we live, I know we live in a time, and as we all have always lived in that time, when it's hard to say out loud that God is great and I am not. We want to say God is great and I'm pretty great too. <laughs> but if we have learned anything through this study, it's okay and it's even better to acknowledge the greatness and glory of God and to also be able to say I'm not great. I have no deser deserving of anything at all. And I'm so thankful for God's amazing love for me. So in terms of our response to that, how does it make me feel? For me, it brings me great comfort. Because if it's at all on me to respond right, to do it well, to do it better, then I'm only going to be momentarily, mildly successful in the grand scheme of things not going to have completeness. I'm going to constantly feel like I'm not measuring up. And I think that's where we get a lot in our society right now of this idea of, you know, you are enough, you know, you're enough. Um, because we want so badly to be enough because we feel so often like we're not, we're not a good mom. 
we're not a good enough wife, we're not a good enough friend, we're not a good enough sister. You know, we, we see and feel our failings and we just want to know that we're enough. But I think the opposite is where the, the true comfort comes from, is being able to say, I'm not enough and I'm so thankful that I don't have to keep lying to myself that I am enough. I am enough. Or, um, you know, completely living, oh, I'm not enough. In the gospel is the reality that I'm not enough and thank God, literally thank God, because he is, he is enough, right? All right, so that brings us to the conclusion of this lesson as we move into day 10, which is always the culmination, really, of this entire lesson. Day 10 is our create and, uh, and share day. And so for this create and share, um, I'll just read to you so you can, you can hear my heart on this. Imagine throwing an extravagant surprise party. All the invitations perfectly and secretly sent with every detail coordinated. Decorations just perfectly themed. Food catered by the best in town. The event ready down to the finest detail with all their favorite colors and foods and music and friends all timed to the perfect moment when they open the door and everyone shouts in joyful unison, surprise, only to have their response be, oh, thanks. Oh, thanks? Hmm. The natural response to such perfect plans laid out with such love and attention is to feel overwhelmed and thankful and completely out of words. That's Paul. That's Romans 11, 33 to 36. That's me. That's you, hopefully. There's actually a word for this. The joyful expression of complete worship and praise is doxology. And there it is in Greek there for you. Doxa, logia. From the Greek doxa meaning glory and logia meaning word. It means literally glory words. It's words that attempt to come together and create a sense of greatness of God. Paul brings together all he's been teaching and sharing and reveling in throughout his letter and erupts in this culminating message into this doxology. Isn't that what we should be doing every day? Shouldn't we awaken each morning so overwhelmed yet again with the greatness of God that our day is a living, breathing, walking, working doxology? What would it look like if in every moment from the mundane, to the exhausting, you let the awe and wonder of God fill you. How would it look to see your small inconveniences and your looming troubles in light of the unsearchable riches, wisdom, and knowledge of God? Create and share your own doxology. Take time to pray and ponder the greatness of God. Allow the Holy Spirit to move in your heart and mind as you appreciate the reality of God's great mercy, love, uh, grace, and love in your life. Write your glory words in a poem or a song on the next page. And I look forward to sharing these words with you and all of our grace groups. All right. So you can see here, uh, I've provided for you a nice big uh, page for you to fill in your uh, doxology, write that out. And I look forward to hearing from you what that is going to uh, look like. And I'd love to hear that. If you want to share that, I especially enjoy reading that online. If you want to uh, share that online and, and encourage other people with that. But just take a moment to be still and hear from God and, and be overwhelmed by what he's given you in your life. Your, your children, your husband, your friends, uh, your family, um, the beauty of this world, your own health, what you've been through, how God's carried you and loved you through so many trials in your life, write a doxology and it could be, it could rhyme. It could just be, you know, words like, you know, Paul has put, put together here, but I will love to hear from you about that. Of course, we'll be together in a little while and, uh, you'll be able to share that with your grace groups as well. All right. I'm really happy to be with you. This is a long lesson, long for me to record and maybe longer than usual for you to stick around to. So thank you for hanging out. There's some great video resources for you at the end of this video. So just wait and we'll go through the end credits a bit or the end little motivation. And at the very end of this, you'll see some clicks for other video resources. I hope you stick around for that and know as always that you are loved and prayed for. And I look forward to being back here again with you real soon in our next lesson. Next and 11. Oh my gosh. Lesson 11 is going to be great. We're going to cover chapter uh, 12. Just 
be getting a portion of it, and you're going to love it. It's going to be awesome. All right. Look forward to seeing you guys back here again real soon. Bye-bye for now.